Good afternoon. My name is Kumbal Subbaswamy. I'm Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And on behalf of the Department of Economics and the entire university community, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the annual Philip, uh, Philip Gamble Memorial Lecture. This lecture is, series is made possible by uh, an endowment that was led by Israel Ragosa to honor one of our great faculty members. Uh, there is no greater legacy than uh, for, for any faculty member to be left behind than to be remembered by former students and create a legacy such as this one. It brings annually to campus a prominent economist to speak on topics as critical as, and as current and diverse and interconnected as climate change, full employment, globalization, and the Wall Street meltdown. Visits such as this and such lectures enrich the lives of students, faculty, and the public alike, and we thank you all for being here. My task today here is to introduce Professor Michael Ash, the head of the Department of Economics and Public Policy, and a professor of public and, uh, economics and public policy and chair of the Department of Economics in the College of Social and Behavioral Science. He will in turn introduce our speaker today, who also happens to be his PhD thesis advisor. Professor Ash works in the, at the intersection of many disciplines specializing in economic policies of health, environment, labor, and a particular emphasis on environmental justice. He teaches in the, on, the, on the economics of health, on economics and public policy, macroeconomics, econometrics, and political economy. And he's certainly, again, in the tradition of uh, Philip Gamble, a great teacher. Just last year, his department recognized him with its outstanding teaching award. He's not only a respected colleague, but he's somebody with a deep belief in his disciplines important to the public good and public service. Professor Ash has served on the staff of President Clinton's Council on Economic Advisors, and just this year he presented before the Massachusetts Legislature's Joint Committee on Higher Education on the impact of, uh, economic impact of investment in public higher education. As the saying goes, no man is a hero to his valet. However, we're about to find out from Michael Ash what he thinks of his thesis advisor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Ash. Thank you, Chancellor, for that very kind introduction. And welcome to, to all, to colleagues, to, to students, to guests. Uh, to Chancellor to, uh, to, to, to Mala. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, and honor to welcome uh, George Akerlof as the 2012 Gamble Lecturer at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, a little bit about George. He uh, earned his BA from Yale University in 1962 and his PhD from MIT uh, four years later. He uh, devoted most of his career to the University of California, Berkeley, eventually as the Koshlin Professor of Economics, with, with time away to conduct research and offer policy advice in India at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, the Federal Reserve, the Brookings Institution, and now the IMF in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, George's list of accomplishments, awards, and articles uh, is extraordinary. Most notable, of course, is his 2001 Nobel Prize in Economics, awarded for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information. But that really tells only part of the story of his most famous paper, uh, The Market for Lemons, Quality, Uncertainty, and the Market Mechanism. The mathematics in the paper is accessible to undergraduates or, or even intrepid high school students. The central metaphor and, and the title come from thinking carefully about the market for used cars, some of which, and only the current owners know which, are, are lemons. The insight can be demonstrated in the classroom using a deck of cards, and I have a three-card Monty version that I've used in, in health uh, economics. So, so it's simple, but it's profound. And the central point of the paper uh, resonates across disciplines, from health and education to finance, in every state capital, many national capitals, even in the core of, of, of Obamacare. And it almost didn't reach us, and that's part of a longer story. So after rejections at the American Economic Review and the Review of Economic Studies for quote-unquote triviality, George submitted the Lemons manuscript to the Journal of Political Economy. 
In a, in a Nobel uh, essay, George described the referee's rejection letter. The referees argued, and, and this, George, writes George, was, was the killer. If the paper was correct, economics would be different. <laughs> Perish the thought. The story has some happy endings, and some endings are still in play. Thanks. First, the Quarterly Journal of Economics recognized the importance of the paper and, and, and published it. George got tenure and has gone on to many, many more great things, including the Nobel and the Gamble. But <laughs> second, George has dedicated much of his career to making economics different. In a host of papers, some co-authored with his wife Janet Yellen, in an economic theorist's book of tales, in looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit, in Animal Spirits with fellow Gamble lecturer Robert Schiller, and most recently in Identity Economics with his co-author Rachel Cranton, George has made economics different, and he's inspired others to make economics different. It's not a finished job, and it's one that we take to heart at UMass. George has brought the real stuff of society, fairness, confidence, corruption, the stories we tell, perception and identity to and back to a discipline that had taken dramatic steps to excise all traces of humanity. Cylonomics, perhaps? George is an extraordinary teacher, and I speak from experience because I was first a student and then a teaching assistant for his graduate macroeconomics course at UC Berkeley. I maintained copies of his lecture notes, which he wrote out newly and carefully by hand each time he taught. He would distribute photocopies of the lecture notes to students before the lecture, and we would delight in watching him follow his own stage directions, such as, erase left-hand side of board, or pause, let students realize that this is a joke, then continue. <laughs> but the substance of those lectures was something else. A conversation about economics would unexpectedly turn into a conversation about car buying, home sales, childcare, or candy bars. I will never forget that Dr. Spock, or Keynesian approach to child care and unemployment versus the Ferberized or monetarist approach. Similarly, the Modigliani-Miller theorem on the neutrality of debt and equity in corporate finance will forever evoke bundled packages of milk bars and nut bars, particularly on this day after, after Halloween. This afternoon, Professor Akerlof will deliver the 2012 Gamble Lecture of the Department of Economics. The Philip Gamble Memorial Lectureship Endowment was established by Israel Ragosa, class of 1942, and other families and friends in honor of Philip Gamble, a member of the economics faculty for, um, for more than 30 years and chair of the department for more than 20 of those. The fund supports an annual lecture series featuring a prominent economist. Previous speakers have included six Nobel Prize winners, including the late Eleanor Ostrom, as well as John Kenneth Galbraith, Barbara Bergman, Lonnie Guineer, Robert Reich, and Marianne Ferber. The Gamble Lectureship is also supported by the Charles L. and Martha S. Gleason Fund. Charles and Martha were economics graduates in 1940 and 1942, and both are now deceased. Before I turn over the floor to Professor Akerlof, let me remind you that you are all welcome to a reception in the Cape Cod Lounge, uh, just, uh, ju just out beyond these doors um, and around the corner to the left, following the 2012 Gamble Lecture. It is my pleasure to present Professor George Akerlof. So thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'm tremendously honored to be here, and especially at this tremendously fine economics department. I've been having a tremendously good time spending the day with all of you. And um, this is truly one of the great economics departments anywhere in the world, and one that is especially devoted uh, to finding out and to pursuing the truth and pursuing the truth that matters for absolutely all of us. So I'm, I'm very, very honored to be here, and I'm very honored uh, especially by Michael's very nice introduction. OK, so let me begin. <laughs> the lecture is going to um, be in two parts. Um, the first part is going to be economic-y stuff, and I'll begin with a small model. There'll be only a few minutes of that, and um, 
this is just the beginning of a paper that I'm writing with Hui Tong at the IMF. Now, what it will do is it'll motivate what comes later. Can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. I'll, yes. Thanks. Good. Okay. So I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit closer and a little bit louder. Um, so it's going to motivate what comes later. Then the rest of the le lecture will be on a book that I'm writing with Bob Schiller called Fishing for Fools, which you saw up there earlier. That's meant to be a popular book. Now, there are two motivations for that book. The first is that we're influenced more than we think by popular books. And the public and economists have too great an acceptance, I think, also, of the view that whatever markets do is right. Of course, all of us would take into account the standard externalities, as they're called. But that does not exhaust the reasons why markets yield uh, bad outcomes. So we're going to explore the, the notion that markets also fish for fools. Now, all economists, it turns out, all economists know this. But that leads to the sec uh, second very general motivation. The rule of what can and cannot be published in economics leaves holes. There's some perfectly valid and important things to say, but there's no way to say them that would be acceptable in any journal. Let me give you one example. For example, quite a few economists thought that financial derivatives would lead to the current crisis. But economists could not figure out, we could not figure out a way to express those views in the form of a paper. So I believe that fishing for fools is one of those holes in economics. Because we all know it, it cannot be published. But then, because it cannot be published in journal form, it then gets ignored. And because it was ignored, we had the financial crisis, which is the central uh, event in the economic history of, the t of our times and perhaps in the history of our times. So with those prefatory notes, let me begin. Okay. So I'm going to give you an elementary model. Okay. <laughs> so as Michael suggested, um, I wrote a paper some time ago called The Market for Lemons. And so today we're going to have a, I'm going to do an extension of that, uh, which gets actually very different conclusions from what we got in the original paper. So with the small change in that model, what we're going to see is we're going to find fishing for fools. And what that means is that everything that I say subsequently is not going to be just gibberish. That means that there's a precise interpretation, a precise interpretation of what it means. So let's begin with the original paper. In that paper, there was asymmetric information. What does that mean? means that the sellers of used cars knew the quality of their car, but the potential buyers of that car could not tell. They did not know what that quality would be. <coughs> so we're going to begin, I'm going to initially run through it with the assumption, the common assumption uh, in economics, that the buyers are smart. In this case, what that means is it means that the buyers understand they, they understand that if the, buy, if the sellers have a particularly good car, they're going to keep it for themselves. And if they have a bad car, that's what they're going to dump into the market. That's going to be a lemon. And then there are going to be two questions that we can ask of this. What, were the, what are the consequences of the asymmetric information for the volume of trade? And what are the consequences for the welfare, for the welfare of the buyers? So I'm going to go through the original model. And I'm going to tell you about that. This, and we're going to take some time doing that. You have to be patient on it. So here's the original model. So first, let me describe the sellers and what the sellers do. So they're used cars, one. Two, those used cars differ in quality. Three, that quality is uniformly distributed. It's uniformly distributed between zero and two. We'll come back to that. Four, all of these used cars are initially owned by the sellers. And then the sellers get $1 worth of utility from one quality unit of used cars. And then six, the sellers know the quality of their used cars, but the buyers do not. So that describes the sellers. Now let's go to the buyers. Okay. There are also potential buyers of used cars. 
Um, those potential buyers then, remember the sellers got one unit of utility from a quality unit. The, se the buyers get three halves dollars worth of unit of utility from one quality unit. And those buyers then, in this version, have rational expectations about the quality distribution of quality of used cars w that will be sold. So they know what the quality, the distribution is going to be, that's going to be sold. So just to be formal about this, we can represent this formally. Uh, and I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to tell you what, it, what I skipped. So it was just skipped points out the following, which I've already pointed out. Sellers value a quality unit of used cars at one, but the buyers value a quality of used car at three halves. And you've got to remember that. So typically, in that case, you know what would happen in traditional markets. If the buyers and sellers have the same information, usually all of the used cars will be sold by the sellers to the potential buyers. Why? Because I said the buyers value the quality units at three halves, and the sellers value them at one. So such trade is what a free market will produce if the buyers have sufficient income, and we have, uh, and both buyers and sellers know the quality of the cars. Okay. Okay. So now I've reviewed the assumptions, but what does our model produce when the sellers know the quality of their cars, but the buyers cannot? tell the quality. So what's the equilibrium? Okay. And the answer is simple. The answer is simple, that there's no equilibrium trade at any price. And the question is, why not? And so I'm going to go through the proof as to why not. Okay. So here's the proof. <laughs> we'll make a proof by contradiction. We'll show that there will not be any trade at any positive price P. Okay. So Let's suppose, let's just suppose, that there is a price for cars of P. First, let's examine what the sellers will do, and we'll see what cars they will offer. The sellers value a quality unit at one. Remember that. Therefore, at a price of P, the sellers will offer all those cars that have quality less than or equal to P. So the sellers are going to offer the quality cars with quality between P, between zero and P. What does that mean? Since the car quality has uniform distribution between zero and P, it means that the average quality that these sellers are going to offer is going to be P over two. So P over two will be the average quality of used cars that are offered. So that tells us what sellers will do if cars are selling at a price P. Now we have to look at the buyers, and we're going to look at the buyers and see what the buyers are going to do. And what's our question? The question is, are the will buyers willing to buy? So let's examine the buyers. Will any buyer be willing to buy at this price P? And now we're going to do a calculation. Okay? The answer is no. Why not? The expected use value uh, to a buyer will be three times times the expected average quality. So it's be three tabs times P over two. Okay. So what's the, then we have to uh, remember that the buyers are smart. They know that sellers are going to adversely select the cars. And uh, so they foresee that if the price of the car is P, the average quality of the price, car is going to be P over two. And so they see that the expect, what they get out of a car is this three halves times P over two, and that's three quarters P. Now then the smart buyer will note that she's going to pay the price P for the car. So she does the calculation that her expected net gain in utility from purchasing the car will be this three quarters P, the three halves times P over two, minus the price she pays. So any buyer who is going into this market, will expect to get minus one quarter P from buying this car, whatever that price piece would be. So what's the conclusion? So there is no gain to the buyer at any positive price. And so any smart buyer, and these are all smart buyers, are going to stay out of the market and there's going to be no trade at all. So what's the conclusion? 
the conclusion here is the trade disappears with asymmetric information. So that's the original paper. That's, I've gone over everything that Michael told you about, except that it was rejected. Okay, so now let's change gears a little bit. So I've reviewed this example, which you may know, but it also sets the background for an alternative model. So we're going to deal with this alternative model. This model has only a slight, a very slight change in assumption. But it yields quite different results. Let's assume, as before, that there's asymmetric information, but the buyers are not smart. Let's suppose that those buyers are naive. That means here that the buyers do not perceive that the sellers are going to selectively choose the worst cars for sale. Instead, we'll say that the, that the sellers that the buyers think the sellers will offer the cars randomly by quality. Remember, these cars are distributed between zero or two, and they're uniformly distributed, so they think the average quality is going to be one. Okay? Since the buyers value a unit of car quality at three halves, that means that they're willing to pay three halves for, um, for cars, and it turns out that three halves is going to be the equilibrium price, so that's going to be the price. Now, let's go back to the sellers, and we see, we're going to see whether those um, buyers are going to get a bargain or not. And actually, we, know, we already know the answer because I've already derived it for you. The sellers um, know, as we said before, the quality of the of car they own. So at the price of three halves, they're going to keep all cars of quality greater than three halves, and they're just going to push on the buyers all the cars between zero and three halves, the cars that are less good, the lemons. And so what's the net result? The net result is the average quality of cars uh, that the buyers are going to get is going to be the uh, average of those cars between zero and three halves, so the buyers are going to get a car of value three quarters. So the average quality of ca uh, cars that the sellers uh, are going to offer is not going to be one that the buyers were naively ex expecting. Instead, it's going to be three quarters. And what it turns out is the buyers will then get a bad deal. Using the exact same logic that we used earlier, the buyers will lose one quarter of the price they pay for the, use, for the cars they buy. They're, that's what they're going to do. But this time, last time, what happened is there was no trade at all. This time, something worse than that happens. It's not only that there's, not, that there's no, no trade at all, there is trade. But these poor buyers, they're getting the lemons. So they're going in because they're naive. The sellers are dumping on them the lemons, and they're going to lose one quarter of the price they pay for them. And um, so, <laughs> so this is a sad story. So here we are. We, did, we have a market that actually is worse than the original lemons market. The lemons market was supposed to be really bad. We didn't get any trade at all, but there should have been trade. Here we have something that's really, that's really a lot worse. The buyers are stupid, and those sellers are going to dump all their bad cars on them. Okay. So uh, that's the story. Okay. Now, you're supposed to draw a conclusion from that. Okay. So what's the conclusion for that? So in this model, where there's naivete, markets do not benefit the buyers. Markets instead play a dual role. So they're doing two things. Some buyers are going to gain, but on average, they're going to lose three-eighths uh, per car that they buy. So what does this show? It shows in a very simple example. This is a very, very simple example, something that we all know. Everybody here in this room knows this, and actually every, even every economist knows it. It shows that markets serve two purposes. They serve a positive purpose of letting people trade according to their relative preferences, and that's what usually happens in economics, but it also shows something else. It shows that if people are naive, if people are naive, markets are going to take advantage of them. Because of their naivete, they're going to suffer a loss in welfare. So this small mathematical example then serves as an introduction to this lecture. Um, it's the basic uh, theory behind fishing for fools. So I've given you this model as motivation, and it's going to underlie everything that's going to follow. 
So this is both an early tri trial run of the work with Hui and the, also the book that I'm trying uh, to write with Bob. So there's going to be no more mathematics or models, and now we switch into popular mode, and uh, hopefully we'll see that maybe this uh, small model we've looked at has some applications. So we're trying to see whether there's some lessons. Okay. Okay, so it's almost a law of nature. From nuclear generators to chainsaws, our most powerful tools are also the most dangerous. Every knife, every knife is a two-edged sword. Okay? So the world's most powerful social and economic tool is the free global market. So what it does, it enables the world's adults to trade with one another. So worldwide, there's some 25 chinquillion possible pairs of buyers and sellers. And as you can see, a chinquillion is a large number. <laughs> so the selection that this huge amount of choice offers to both buyers and sellers, it makes us all better off. But that's just the beginning of the power of markets. So I just gave you Milton Friedman, so this would be a Milton Friedman line. Okay. Markets are also beneficial for another reason. Okay, why? Because anyone with an idea regarding how they can offer a better deal can uh, qu quite possibly can make a profit on it. Such ideas are then going to be selectively sought out and adopted. Over the course of the last century, if each one of us had only one such idea once a month, four trillion new ideas would have been generated. That's a lot of ideas, actually. The selective adoption of the best of these new ideas, as allowed by the free market, has powerful effect. So just to think about that power of effect, over our lifetimes, we will see a lot of change. So mainly because of these new ideas, our standard of living will be, go up by something like sixfold over the course of our lifetimes. Thus, for example, in the U.S., our older retirees, those over the age of 80, they were born in a country that was poorer than present-day Mexico. Okay, okay so the, I've just stated Paul Romer's um, economics. Okay. okay, so markets are capable of such power for good because they, they allow so much positive selection. But they can also allow a great deal of harm because they also allow negative selection. Not all of those four trillion ideas are good for you and good for me. Some of them are good for you and uh, some of them are bad for me. And associated with such ideas come the tricks to inveigle me into buying in. So thus free markets do not just produce good for you, good for me, they also may produce uh, good for you, bad for me, and vice versa. So furthermore, they also systematically aim for our weak spots. So what did they do? They seek out and take aim for our emotional or cognitive weaknesses. They seek to block our channels of information and then take advantage of those weaknesses. They seek out and take advantages of our failures to understand, which often occur, our failures to understand that we don't know what we don't know. So what does this mean? What this means is that markets enable, they enable fishing for fools. Okay? So fishing for fools. So what is a fool? So what is a fool with a PH? So fool with a PH is a new word. And such a word should already exist in English, but it does not. In standard English, according to its dictionary definition, a fool with an F is a stupid or silly person. Okay. This reflects, I think, a deep philosophical mistake. It's perfectly possible to make an error, but still be quite rational and quite intelligent. You can make a perfectly intelligent decision one that would be natural and easily made by an intelligent person, but it turns out to be a mistake. 
Someone who makes such a mistake by our definition is not a fool with an F, he is instead a fool with a PH. Okay? So that's a fool. Let's now look at, think about fishing. Such a word, um, so fishing is uh, computerese. Let, let me just see that I'm in the right spot. Uh, I think I give you one. Yeah, I think, oops, I gotta get back. Page up. Uh, okay, there's four. Okay, so now let's talk about fishing. Uh, fish is a recent word, fairly recent word. It's computerese, but we should, but we shall use it with a much broader meaning. Free markets open us up to be fools with a ph. They open us up to those who seek to influence us to do what they want, but that's not necessarily good for ourselves. They allow us, in other words, to be fish. So we live in a world where some six billion adults can fish us for being a fool. We have intentionally opened ourselves up to such exploitations because of the obvious advantages. But then we must also think about the other side of this bargain. Okay. So fishing for fools probably, so it probably has relatively little effect on us when we are aware of it. So the example of fishing on the computer serves us well here. Occasionally, occasionally one or another of us gets hooked in a fish. <laughs> the estimates for the United States range from 0.6 million to 3.6 million per year. That presumably is enough to keep the fishers in business. I'm sure you get quite a few of these things um, on, in your computer. Um, but compared to, say, the number and cost of auto accidents, this is probably something that's relatively minor. Why? because we now know about computer phishing and we guard against it. We have all kinds of ways, including not opening the thing which tells us that we just won the prize uh, in Ireland that's going to give us $200,000. So it's a minor's nuisance. But what happens if we ignore the fish? The example of phishing on the computer, um, yeah. What would happen if we denied it? because that was a part of our constitutional psychological makeup. Or what would happen if we denied it because we'd been sold a bad bit of intellectual goods? What would happen if we denied it because we were sold a bad bit of intellectual goods which said the free markets, like the internet, always invariably give us what we want because we are free to choose, okay? Then fishing could have a major impact and I'm gonna give you three examples. So the first example comes from health. Okay? In the United States, three quarters of all adults are overweight. Yet worse, a third of us are not just overweight, but obese. Well, does the market help us with this problem? Well, maybe it does a little. So how would it help us? Well, we can go to Weight Watchers. Uh, we can drink Diet Coke or even Diet Pepsi and we can go and eat vegetables. Now that's some help for all of us who are concerned about our weight, okay? But go to almost any mall, any place in the country, and there will be the smell of those Cinnabons. There must be a mall near here where they have Cinnabons. Um, and those Cinnabons are waiting for you. That smell like a moss pheromones is a call. It's a call to all of us overweight, obese people. It is doing a fish for fools. Now, between 1970 and 2003, the U.S. daily food calorie intake increased by 23.4 percent, and 480 of those of the 523 calorie increase that was all in unhealthy foods. That is, it was in fats and oils, grains, and sugar and sweeteners. So, Cinnabon is only example but it's also a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the temptations that the market is going to strew in our path, okay? I'm gonna give you two more examples. Example two, people save too little because they're constantly tempted, and we're gonna to come to back to this later in detail. And example three is the Great Recession. The Great Recession was caused by fishing for fools, and as I said, we'll come back to that and see it later. So what are the general consequences? 
We've cited just three examples of the consequences of fishing for fools and the perils we run if we ignore it. Um, and what this book will do is it'll explore these examples in much more detail and it also explores many others, okay? So now I'm going to go through some of the chapters in the book, or at least in the manuscript that I'm currently writing. Okay. <coughs> so the next chapter, I'm, I'm going to skip the next chapter. It just describes the advantages of the fishers relative to the weaknesses of the fools. So it tells you why sometimes this fish happens to be caught, you know? There are a lot of fish swimming around the sea, and, uh, you know, there's only a hook here and there. So most of the time, the fish don't get caught, but the, fisher, the fishermen, they're smart. And, you know, they're smart. They're us, people. And they occasionally catch a fish. And so the poor fish do get caught. Okay. So that's what that chapter does. So now I'm only going to summarize chapter three. So chapter three describes the history leading up to the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 and the Pure Food and Drugs Act of the same year. So what this history allows us to see, it allows us to see a world in which was a, there was a great deal of fishing for fools. And it can be summarized in two pictures. So I'm going to give you two pictures. Um, the first is the label for Swaim's Panacea. And Swaim's Panacea, you can see the picture, I think you can, um, was a pro gave a promise to cure almost every illness. Anything that you could think of that you have, you would want to go to Swaim's, at least according to the bottle. Now, well, it didn't do so well. Instead, it contained mercury and it killed people. But I guess you had one uh, consolation. If you took Swaim's, you'd have uh, Hercules. That's Hercules up there. Uh, Slaying some, uh, slaying some the, the snakes on the gorgon's head, I think. And you would have had Hercules on your side. Well, later in the century, if you decided you didn't want Swaim's, you might go to Radom's Microbe Killer. Now, Radom's, Radom's Microbe Killer wasn't as bad as Swaim's because it contained water and dilute muriatic acid. I think. I don't know. I think dilute muriatic acid is nowhere near as bad as the mercury. Um, so it probably had relatively few bad side effects. But it was useful because it made Radom, who had been a gardener in Austin, Texas, a fortune. And he, had, he got a wonderful mansion on Fifth Avenue in New York. Okay, so this just indicates, you know, if people say that you know you you should just be allowed to free and to be free to choose, there should be no regulation. This tells you just go through the history. The history tells you when we didn't have regulation of this thing, people were buying radams and people were buying swames and you know these things like the food and uh, the FDA and the meat uh, packaging act. They really have done a lot of good. And let's not forget. Okay. Now let's go to somebody else. Okay. So this takes us to the next chapter. Okay? Probably most everyone here knows uh, who Susie Orman is. Um, so when I asked an economist friend of mine about her, he had the predictable uh, reaction. So this is what he said. He, had, he said he'd watched her for only 10 seconds, and he could not stand her mommy knows best voice. He found her investment advice simplistic. And that's what most economists will tell you, you know. But then that means, but there's a puzzle, okay? There's a puzzle. That, it does not explain why Orman's audiences are there lapping her up. So her most popular book is the following. It's The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom, Practical and Spiritual Steps So You Can Stop Worrying, okay? So let's contrast what she says, tells us there with the portrait given of consumer spending in the economics textbooks. Probably your economics textbooks here tell the same thing. I, I think it probably does. So according to economics textbooks, we decide on our demand for the proverbial apples and oranges by having a budget for our spending. And then we choose the combination of apples and oranges that we can buy that's going to maximize our happiness. Um, but Susie Orman's financial advice books 
tell us that consumers do not follow such a textbook protocol in their purchases. Now, one question as an economist is how could consumers do anything other than what the textbooks describe? You know, it seems to me, you know, I've been an economist for a long time, it seems to me almost impossible that anyone could do anything different. But in fact, people do. Orman tells us that people have emotional hang-ups with regard to money and with regard to spending it. And she says also that people are not honest with themselves. And as a consequence, they do not engage in rational budgeting. So how could she know this? How could she know something that, that economists don't know? Well, she's a financial advisor, and with her various customers and clientele, she has a test. She asks her advisees to add up their expenditures, and those expenditures all but invariably, they all but invariably fall short of what a documented accounting from the records later turns up. So what is happening figuratively? So figuratively, relative to that proverbial trip to the supermarket to buy apples and oranges, this is what the people are doing. This is what her advisees do. They spend too much time in the fruit section buying all those apples and oranges, and by the time they reach dairy products, there's nothing left over for the eggs and the milk. In real life, such budgetary failure translates into having nothing left over for savings. So this failure to deal cognitively and emotionally with money, says Orman, leads to those unpaid bills. So it's her mission, it's her mission to keep those bills down so that her readers and her clients will not uh, worry at night. So that's the role of mommy, and also why those audience tolerate that mommy knows best voice. And I think it's worth noting, it's worth noting more than parenthetically, that worries, as noted in Orman's subtitle, are central concerns of the financial advice books. But I think you can look up in the index of any economics book and you're not going to find it says the word worries. I, I looked, I tried to find it, at least in Econ 1 books, and I couldn't find it. So, and I don't think you'll find it in the intermediate books either. Okay. So we, don't need, we do not just need to take Orman's word for it. We can put together a statistical story which indicates that a very significant fraction, a very significant fraction of consumers are worried about how they're going to make ends meet. So now, now I'm going to give a statistical portrait that indicates that there's some merit to Orman's arguments. Okay. So a paper by Anna Maria Lasardi asked the following question. How confident are you that you could come up with $2,000 if an expected need arose within the next month. So almost 50% of US respondents replied either that they could not or they probably could not come up with the needed $2,000. The same difficulties regarding finances can be gleaned from the survey of consumer finances. So in 2004, according to the standard survey source from the Federal Reserve, the bottom half of all households had an average net worth of $23,000. Of that, a rough accounting indicates an average of about, only about $10,000 in financial assets, and then of course, most of those, that money in financial assets is going to be further tied up in some kind of um, pension fund that's going to be difficult to draw on. Divorce statistics give a similar picture of divorcing couples. So we have passed uh, data on divorcing couples, and that showed that their average value of assets was less than $25,000 in inflation-adjusted dollars. And remember, th these, these data on the divorcing couples, they were from the divorcing couples where the divorce went through the courts. So these are actually the richer couples rather than the poor. Now, we get a similar picture from data on expenditures relative uh, to payday. For workers paid once a month, for workers paid once a month, their expenditures are down a remarkable 20% on average by the time they're about to receive their next paycheck. And then, and then we have one more statistic. Then we have the number of bankruptcies. So by my calculation, there's something like a 20 to 25% chance that someone in the United States will go bankrupt over the course of their lifetimes. Okay. So this gives a statistical picture which shows that, yes, people are not, people do have a problem saving. Okay. 
So this poses a problem. So the Susie Orman view of the world suggests that people are spending too much and they're worried as a result. And that leads to a question, why? So there's another perspective. So we go back to 1930, John Maynard Keynes wrote a short essay. He wrote a short essay on what life would be like for our grandchildren 100 years later, presumably in 2030. Now, in one respect, Keynes was totally correct. He predicted that real income would be some eight times higher. So far, income has increased by six times, and so, and he's, so he's right on target uh, for 2030. But in another respect, Keynes was totally off the mark. He did not predict that the grandchildren would be going to bed worried about their next shilling. Instead, he said they would be worrying about how to use their surfeit of leisure. He said the work week would fall to 15 hours. Furthermore, Keynes failed to predict the housewife who exhausted from the first and then what is called the second shift. The but the perspective of this book coupled with listening to Susie Orman, gives us reason for this. So we have reason why people seem to be li living lives of quiet desperation. So what's the answer to the puzzle? So in the United States, the goal of almost every business person is to get you to spend your money. There are few businesses actually out there which want you to save your money, but most of them are really to get you to spend your money. So just think about it. Life is a proverbial trip. It's a proverbial trip to a parking lot in which you're constantly passing those spaces left open for the disabled. So life in a capitalist economy is just a continual temptation. So just think about it. Walk down any city street. Those shop windows are literally there to make you come in and buy. That's what they're doing. They want you to come and buy. They're not there to tell you to stay out and save your money and go home. <laughs> You're supposed to come in and buy. And there's even a nice song about it. This is actually one of my favorite songs. I don't know whether I should sing it to you. I don't think I will. So it's, how much is that doggy in the window? You know, they put the doggies in the window, those cute little things. They don't put the parakeets in the window, you know? And you go past and you say, gee, I that doggy's so cute, you know? And you know, you should go back to the song. That song is really outrageous. Do you know, the girl who sings this song, you know what she's going to do? She's going to go and she's going to buy that doggy. And what she's going to do with the doggy, she's not going to take the doggy home. She's going to give it to her boyfriend and she's going to leave for California. <laughs> and leave the poor guy with the dog. So anyway, that's her, that's the story. Now, but this is what capitalist economy is like. In the shopping mall, one is not literally down the street looking in the windows, but there's temptation on, on either side of the aisle, and all of that tension is there asking you to buy. Actually, there are whole books of telling people who run stores about how you arrange those aisles to get people to buy more. It's no coincidence that the milk and the eggs are, are in the back. And it's no coincidence that the candy is right there when you're going to leave. Okay, so this is what uh, things are all about. No matter what kind of transaction you are, the people are getting you to try to buy. Um, so that's what we are. So consumer advocates are worried about credit cards and their effects. And there's good evidence. I think there's good evidence that credit cards lead people to spend more. But the idea of getting tempting the consumer to buy to spend her money is much more general as in the very nature of free market capitalism. Okay, so this is a very general message and this is just the nature of the society in which we live. So that Susie Orman show that we all thought was so annoying, that's just, no, that's no coincidence. That, as much as those stores that we pass, that is part of the system we live in. And so, we should, I don't know whether we should accept it, but it's part of what we do. The financial crisis. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the financial crisis. I'm going to talk about it in very few words. But I actually think maybe, you know, you can say lots of complicated things about the financial crisis and they'll all be true. But I, I think I'm going to try to go to what I think is the essence of the country, financial crisis. So there are hundreds of books on the financial crisis. And the typical one is 500 pages long, and I've, I haven't read hundreds, but I've read many, many. And the typical book 
tells the story of my institution, say, of somebody who was at Lehman Brothers or somebody who's going to, who was at Goldman Sachs or you have one on Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac or you have one on the Fed and one on the Treasury. And in the story of every book is my institution, the one I'm writing about, is central to the crisis. Okay? So the aim of this chapter of this book, Fishing for Fools, is to do the opposite. The aim of this chapter is to tell the story of the crisis in general terms. So you scratch any economist and we're going to go into economic speak. So we're trained to think in terms of supply, things like supply and demand. So that means that, means that we ask, often ask very good questions and have good analyses of problems. So fishing for fools is an offshoot. It's an offshoot of how we standard economists typically do our analysis. But it turns out it's not so standard. It's not so standard that every economist was asking the right questions in the buildup to the crisis. But we should have been. Why should we have been? Because fishing for fools gives us an extremely succinct explanation for what happened. So let me give you just one rendition of that. So here's that rendition. If I have a reputation, if I have a reputation for selling perfect, beautiful avocados, I have an opportunity. I can sell you a rotten avocado at the price you would pay for the perfect ripe one. So I will have mined my reputation. And I will have also fished you for a fool. Okay? So such a story lies at the heart of the continuing financial crisis that dominates the economics of our times. The reputation mining in question involved the subversion of the system for rating uh, fixed income securities. So let me give you a bit of a story. So the reputations of Moody's and Standard and Poor's had been built up over the course of almost a century. Their job, their job was to rate bonds on their probability of default. But then, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, the ratings agencies took on themselves the task not just of rating bonds, but also of rating more complex derivative securities, packages of bonds, and all kinds of complicated things. The complexities of the payment structures um, made them somewhat hard to rate, but something else made the rating all but impossible. The underlying assets, such as mortgages, were inaccessible to the raiders. So even if you wanted to do so, it was all but impossible to do so. But the public, the public out there, would believe whatever ratings were given uh, them by the agencies. And then an industry grew up, an industry grew up simply to do a reputation mine. Okay? So what happened by analogy? By analogy, rotten avocados were being labeled perfect. And with that label, they commanded premium prices. And a whole central valley full of growers went into the profitable business of producing such avocados. This mining of the ratings is then the basic story of the financial crisis. So I'll give you a little bit more. I'll tell you just a bit of detail. But that, that's really the basic of what happened. So that's not all of the explanation. We must also explain why the production and sale of those overrated securities brought down the financial system. So I guess it would be okay if you bought one of my bad avocados, you know, and you take it home and, you know, throw it in the garbage or whatever. But in the case of these rotten securities, something bad happened further. So the answer, again, is simple. The value of these securities reflected their rating. That enabled commercial banks, investment banks, and also hedge funds to borrow huge amounts of money, short term, invest in the overrated securities, and pocket small profits from the interest spread on every dollar of investment. And in doing so, they all took on a lot of leverage. That borrowing was made with the rotten securities as collateral. So basically what these people did was they talk on, took on these terrible avocados and then they went to the bank and borrowed on them. And they were able to borrow them because the securities agencies had actually said, the, you know, they were great avocados. And the bank says, yes. Okay. So um, 
That borrowing was made with the rotten securities as collateral, and the for the moment it seemed to be as good as gold, the ratings indicated there was almost no chance of default. But then, of course, we all know the truth was discovered, and those avocados, perfect as they were on the outside, were really rotten on the inside. They were worth much less than the bankers and finance managers had paid for them. So what did we find? We found from Frankfurt to New York to Reykjavik that financial institutions owed much more than they owned. And without bailout, they were going to be bankrupt. And that's what we're finding, and that's what the continued story is of our times. So, okay. So just to give you a summarized summary of the chapter, the chapter answers four questions. Is the historical answers uh, to these questions. How would the ratings agencies initially establish their reputation? One, what then changed making it more profitable to mine that reputation than to keep it? Why were the buyers of those rotten securities so naive? And why was the financial system so vulnerable to the discovery that the assets were so rotten? Okay. So that's basically my story. Um, I'll give you a list of the future chapters of the book. Actually, I've written all the, I've written all the, the conclusion and the looting chapter. So, um, but I thought, so, um, so this is what the rest of the book is like, you know. And each of these chapters, I hope, is fun. You know, it's fun to write the advertising chapter and the, the lobbying chapter, socialist economies chapter. So, so let me just give you a summary. Okay, and I, now I have to skip to the end. So, um, so I'm skipping what? Um, so now I come to the conclusion, and let me see what I have to say about conclusion. So I think the first part of the conclusion is the following, that fishing for fools is important. Uh, the second is that it creates bad equilibrium, and it does so especially so if we think markets are totally benign and if we ignore the fishing for fools and the role that markets play in that. Okay, so thank you. Okay. So shall I take questions? So, um, so let me take questions if there are any questions. Yes. So, why don't you stand up so we're... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 okay. So I'll, I'll try to repeat your question. Okay. Uh, or speak loudly, yeah. yeah. so the question is about the rating agencies. Yeah. I don't think, uh, are you characterizing them as, as fishing? Or are you characterizing them as intermediaries that are naive? Or, or something else? Mm. Well, the ratings agencies, okay, so, yeah. Oh. Well, the ratings agencies are supposed to do a rating. Okay. Um, they used sort of standard economic models to do this. And um, I think the way to put it is the people who those ratings were the investment houses. So that was the change. Previously, uh, Moody's and Standards and Poor's, what they did is they, they published books, expensive books, which um, your library might have to buy, especially if it was a business library. Then something like in the 1970s, for the first time, Moody's decided it was going to take payment for these things. Now, the thing is, the ratings agencies, so the answer is what you say is true. But, but the ratings agencies did, had no incentive to behave in any other way. So any person in the ratings agency who s would say, gee, we're only thinking that house prices are going to go up, so these uh, mortgages are all getting good, what do you think would happen to that person? That person was going to be fired. First of all, what, how is that chain going to work? Um, we'll take some... Um, 
investment house that's trying to sell this package of bonds. Um, if this guy comes and says, gee, I don't think those bonds are so good, I think we shouldn't assume that those prices are always going to go up, um, the, uh, the investment house which is selling that package is going to say, gee, I'm not sure we want you to be rating our agency. We'll go to, we'll go to the other one or we'll go to some other advisor. Now, you take the, the person farther down the list, the person who is going to make this wisecrack suggestion, that person is going to know that it's not in their interest. So in this sense, the ratings agencies were fishing for fools. So they weren't directly fishing for fools. They were at the end of this chain in which they were going to fish for fools. So then what happened, so then once you had these, these bad ratings, uh, then in fact, I'm going to use the word, my word intentionally. Then what that did is that metastasized to all kinds of other areas of the economy. So you had, this one, you had this one very basic misalignment, but then the trouble was that the economy was in such a way that with this misalignment, you could get this terrible metastas metastasization that then affected the rest of the economy. Okay. All right, so I have an explanation for it. I, I think this explanation... So, you go back to the, 19, the late 20s, and you can find the same thing. And there, the, you go to the, into the history of, let's say, Goldman Sachs. So, Goldman Sachs sold some things that were probably worse than anything that anybody's going to buy today, although I'm not, that maybe that's an exaggeration. But they sold some very, very, very bad things. But then the investment houses went into a different mode of operation. Uh, actually, this was, they, they reverted, actually, to their previous mode. So what, what, are the invest, what are the investment houses supposed to do? These guys were supposed to be underwriters. So you are, so you, you own some, some nice company. Uh, Chrysler, we'll say, and um, you have to float, you, you have all various financial um, deals that you need to do. So what do you do? You come to New York and you come to Goldman Sachs, and I'm your friend, you're my client, and I'm like your lawyer, I tell you what to do. So what is my business? My business is to be your friend and to give you nice advice, and you're my client, and then, occasionally, what you're going to do is you're going to be nice to me, since you're my friend, and you, in return for this advice, you're going to let me float your bonds, which will occur, or some kind of stock issuance. So basically, I'm in, the, I'm in a very, I'm in a, I'm in a different, I'm in, in position of being your fiduciary, your advisor, your lawyer. Your advisor and your lawyer does not want this, uh, the ratings agencies to be going out and uh, and misrating the bonds. And so, at this point, the, the interest of the investment houses was to police the rating agencies. But then life changed. How did life change? The investment houses found that, they, that there was much more money to be made relative to the client business to be made in terms of their own trading. And so once they became traders, with a D, um, they... Um, uh, once they became traders, the, the ethics changed. And actually, one can see this. There's a, there's a document in the history of Goldman Sachs. So there was a, um, there was a, a director in the, let's say, I think this is, dates probably from the 1970s, by the name of John Whitehead. And he was worried about the, the, the fact that the ethics was changing. And he... Um, and he wrote a set of 15 principles for Goldman Sachs to follow. And these are the principles that Goldman Sachs does follow. It begins, um, the first principle is um, the customer should always come first. So that's the... Um, so, but, but he was worried about this. He was worried about it because he saw the changes that were beginning to take place in the business, and he was worried about the changes in ethics. And I guess maybe those changes in ethics did come about, and, uh, and that's what we see.
Uh, yeah. What? Um, okay, so the initial story was, so you got exactly what the story is. The initial story was that people see the trade as minus P over 4, and therefore there's no trade at all. The people, they just stay out of the market. There's no loss in welfare. Then the story is, I'm stupid. I'm naive. I don't know that there are going to be these people doing adverse selection. And so then I come into the market, and then I get gypped. And so I get gypped, I go along, and uh, life goes along, and I get gypped. I buy these bad cars. And then suddenly, you know, I comes in and I say, God, what have I done? I bought these bad cars. And then I stop and say so the economy crunches to a halt. Now, what makes that worse is I bought the, not only if I bought the bad cars, but I go into the bank and bought that bad cars. And so not only, I, I'm, I'm wiped out, I don't have my car anymore. And furthermore, I don't know, the bank is bankrupt because it's made me this bad loan for which I've put up the bad car. So that, I think that's the answer to your question. Or, or maybe. You mean how did we get there in the first place? Oh, okay. That's a very good question. I think most of the, the thing is, it's, okay, so, so I think, I think that's actually the last, I think that's, Interestingly, I think that's, that's equivalent to the last question, how did we get there? So, what, okay, so I'll give you a little bit of economic history, which is, so we went, through the 19, we went through the 1920s and there was this fishing for fools. Then what happened in the, after that fishing for fools is uh, that we set, in, we set up, uh, I think, good regulation of the securities industry, where, in fact, it became quite difficult to, to fish for fools. We then let, uh, then something like 40 years passed. The, um, during those 40 years, it turned out that the investment houses saw that their interest was to be honest, not to, not to fish for fools. So the economy grew during that time. And then, in fact, then we have this, then, in fact, because, because the, they see we have these new ideas and people see you can sell all of these derivative securities, and you can, and these you have some kind of, um, some kind of uh, metastatization in which, in fact, you get uh, you get this new these new ideas, but they turn out not to be good for you; they turn out to be bad for you. Okay. Um, if you give this talk about yeah. the past, there are more people, and some of them, say, well, look, we slice and dice these things. Mm. Okay, can I, can I answer it? Oh, I see. People really believe this? Or were they just putting on an act to say? Okay. Um, yeah, I think the people really believe this. I mean, the people really believe this. The people bought these assets. They didn't see that there was going... It, it goes exactly to the model that we had at the very beginning. The people do not see that there's going to be this adverse selection in which the mortgages that are going to be produced are going to be these bad avocados. That somehow, that if you get a false rating there, people did not know that there was, going, there was this false rating. And then once there was the false rating, I mean, think about this. What, if, I can, if, if I can sell rotten avocados, they're probably much cheaper to produce than good avocados. 
And so what's going to be produced with perfect markets, you're going to get an infinite supply of those bad avocados. No, no, I don't think that I, I well, are you, okay, so the question, some, okay, the question is Wall Street people. You know, it's a big chain. The people, okay, so I think there's, okay, so the, the people in California who are making the bad mortgages, there's no question they knew. That they must have known. The, the, the script for how the salespeople were supposed to go out and the way the contracts are written, those people knew. Then what you do is you go through some kind of uh, long chain, and at the end of those chain, the people who are, who are supposed to be the buyers of that, they are the buyers of the lemons, and they don't know. So the whole thing was that you're, you're supposed to take this bad avocado at the end, you send it, to, you send it through a big chain in which you put, uh, you put a lot of wrapping on it, and wrap it in fine paper, and then the buyer is not supposed to know. So going through Wall Street put it into fine paper and 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 hid the fact that these were bad avocados. And who? What was what was the wrapping on those uh, avocados? The wrapping was, of course, the ratings. So you know, you didn't even need to look at. It. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Y yes. Yes. Say, speak louder so other people can hear. Yeah. going to be self-policing. So there were even, there were government officials, high government officials who said that economic, that free markets would be self -policing. The thing is that, um, uh, that the SEC did put in effective, um, effective regulation as of the 1930s. But then it was just ignored, and it was just assumed. Then we went into an ideology where it was believed the free markets would just be benign. And that's what this book is aimed at. This book is aimed at saying, um, no, we, so this book is aimed at saying that this is something that's automatically going to come out of market systems, because market systems don't just produce what's good for me. That may, they may produce that most of the time. We have this nice building here. And, we have pretty nice lives. But sometimes, and it could be very important, the market's going to produce what's um, bad for me. And um, so, so, um, so the thing is, the market, the, the, the whole idea of this book, so there are many, many examples in economics, since you can go into finance, in which uh, the people who are naive, they lose out. Uh, but, the trouble with these examples in the way that economics is written and taught is that each of these examples appears to be just in this special situation. We should appreciate the fact that markets are going to take advantage of people um, if they're not wary as, as, a very important, uh, as a very important fundamental principle of economics. And so it isn't that, it, that every economist wouldn't agree with this. It's just that we ought to put ourselves in the mode that we know we're, we're careful. So when you open your computer, so this thing goes back to your question. When you open your computer, you're careful. I'm sure as you are. And so this just says that we've we got to put people in the mode where they're going to be more careful and they're not going to buy these rotten bottom packages. Okay, so, yeah. Hi, I'm just wondering, what are the the fundamental underlying principles of free markets is that they aim for your weak spots, seek out emotional and cognitive weaknesses, block current channels of information, and play on the fact that what we don't know, we don't know. How is it possible to be an aware consumer and not naive? I, I didn't the last thing. How, how is it possible to not be naive? If, if businesses make money off fishing, how can you not be fooled when... 
Well, yeah, I think people are stupid because they're okay. naive. It's pretty hard to copy. Okay. So what is the? So the thing is, we're very smart, and we're trying to always look out. But they're very smart, and they're always trying to fool us. So sometimes we may win most of the time, but sometimes we're going to, to be naive. And so some of the time we're actually they're going to be successful in their being a fish. Remember, so so they have a so that was the chapter I skipped. So, um, <laughs> so the idea is that the um, the question is what is what are the advantages of the fishers and what is the weaknesses of fools? One of the advantages of the fishers is that there's so many of them. Every one of us can be a fisher. And there may be a smart one, uh, just a very smart one. And then also, the, the thing is that every one of us, most of the time we're going to be smart, but some of the time we're going to have weaknesses. And so then we have weaknesses, we're going to be fish. So, so they're very big space, both of the fishers, and they're very big space of our weaknesses, and they counterbalance the fact that we're also very, very small. And that, that's the answer to your question. Uh, yeah. If you look at the Bernie Madoff either yeah. scheme or scam, depending uh -huh. on the uh, yes. uh, the, the were there any smart people in the scheme of things at all? Okay. Okay. Well, Ely Wiesel, for example. Uh, yes, I actually know surprisingly a number of people who are either connected or actually were fishing by Bernie Madoff. So I, yeah, he, I, guess, I guess he would manage to have some kind of persona where people thought that they could invest their money with him and they'd win. It was very, so that's an example. That's a very good example. The idea of a, of a rating to agency, rating agency, sounds like the slippery of the slopes. Uh, so is there a way that, that you can establish credibility for rating agencies like external to them, or do we just kind of have to figure it out? Um, okay. Well, the ratings agencies should have been supervised by the SEC. The SEC was responsible for their, um, in, for their regulation. SEC should have been on this. But the thing is, that's unfair to blame the SEC because one of the chapters that I didn't cover um, about lobbying, there's a great deal of lobbying to keep down the money that goes to the regulators and especially the SEC. So the fact is that we're not putting the money that we need to. So this is, the, uh, this is another answer to your question. We as a public are not sufficiently wary about these things, and we're not we're letting the people who have an interest in keeping the regulation down uh, to, to get their way. And so, so the SEC gets blamed a lot, but the, the SEC is not given the sufficient budget to do what they need to do. Yeah. Hi. Um, so when you were talking about health and you used uh, Cinnabon as a metaphor for a rising obesity, it made me think of low-income neighborhoods mm -hmm. and how a lot of times they have to go to fast food chains because of lack of access to grocery stores and lack of food affordability and all these other socioeconomic factors that limit their choice. So then are they being fished or are they subject to their socioeconomic status? Mm. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I feel if you have a tougher life, um, it's easier to be fished. You just have more cognitive things on your plate that you have to deal with. And therefore, so, I, so there's a book being written by Eldar Shafir and um, Sendhal Molinejo. It shows that people under stress tend to make bad decisions. So I feel that, that, you know, it seems to me if you're under stress, it is it's much easier not to, do, to go out and eat the Cinnabon, for example. It's, it's much easier to give in to, to what would be called a temptation. But in that case, 
this case, they might know, they know that you know vegetables are more healthy for them, but they just cannot access them or they can't afford them. So what about these people who know that it's bad for them, but they just don't have, like, okay. they can't take Okay, well that's, you know, all right. Um, okay, you see that would be a, se okay, so that I would classify as a separate problem. I'm not telling you every problem in the world is going to be fishing for fools, but, but the thing is, the Cinnabons, that smell that gets you, and then you go and buy the Cinnabon, that's definitely a fishing for fools, okay? So let's not, you know, um, so the, the free market is not helping people choose the, the, choose the things that are good for them. They're not getting an incentive to do that. They're getting an incentive to go and whatever the free market wants to sell them, whether that's calorific or not. Okay, so that, that's, I, I can believe it's also worse to be low income. I've always believed that it was bad to be, uh, to, be to have low income. And uh, that's also a further problem. may be difficult doesn't mean that we shouldn't have regulations. So, um, uh, so the fact is, I, take, take the example of Cinnabons. What do you do about the Cinnabons? The fact, the fact is, I'm not sure I know what to do about the Cinnabons. Um, maybe there should be a regulation that they're not allowed to have, they're supposed to have chimneys so the smell doesn't go out. <laughs> into the mall. Um, but I think, I think in each of these things, you've got to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So in the case of sec financial securities, it is just crazy not to have a very high level of, of regulation of financial securities and also having people who look over financial securities and, and give an independent evaluation. So um, the fact is, part of the message of this book is that you have this problem. This problem isn't like the standard economics where you have an externality and you can just put, uh, put a tax because this stuff is really interwoven into the, into the economic system. And the same forces which are going to give you the benign thing, which is what we want, are going to give you the malignant thing. And so when you deal with malignancies, you, it is very, have to use your judgment as to exactly how far you're going to go. So, you know, you're, so you're going to need the regulation, but you should also be aware that this is regulation which is going to be very difficult and going to have side effects. And so what you do is you don't go to some kind of person who says, no matter what, we should be free to choose. You have to use your judgment as to exactly how far you go. You've got to look at the positives and you have to look at the bad side of it. Okay, now that may be a long talk, but, but the thing is, this is, a very different, this is a very different view than what you're going to learn from most economics textbooks, We say, you know, everything's an externality. These things aren't externalities. Instead, these are things that are, that are, that are ingrained exactly into the economic system. And so any regulation you're going to put in is going to have side effects and you have to wait. And that's what we do. That's what a lot of medicine is all about. A lot of medicine is you have this terrible procedure and you have to, you have to weigh the terrible procedure against the fact if you don't do the procedure, it's going to be worse. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, thank you all. Hold on one second, please. <laughs> Thank you. 
all of you know that we're going to have a reception in the Cape Cod Lounge. Um, Professor Akawa will be there and continue uh, the conversation. Um, and uh, please join me again in thank you.